are relentless in their dedication to a job well done. The science behind wildlife conservation is constantly evolving. And our biologists are leading the way with groundbreaking and cutting edge techniques that the entire scientific community benefits from. If that's not enough to make you proud, then consider this. We've been doing all this since our agency's birth in 1909 without using a dime of taxpayer money. That's because the Wildlife Department is designed as a user pay, user benefit agency. It's sportsmen and wildlife enthusiasts who pay the bill for wildlife conservation in Oklahoma. Revenue from the sale of hunting and fishing licenses make up the majority of the agency's budget. There's also another unique way that outdoorsmen contribute financially. Each time someone buys a gun, ammunition, fishing equipment, or fuel for their boat, a small portion of the tax they pay at the register is used for wildlife conservation. But hunters and anglers don't just contribute financially. A long time ago, we recognized that sportsmen are our most effective management tool. Shaping regulations and making sure everyone complies to them has played a major role in bringing many species back from the brink of extinction. To unimaginable numbers, as the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation has accomplished, we are positive our agency's best days are yet to come. You can see it on our faces. You can feel it with your hands. And you can hear it on the landscape. You'll find us working hard to make your state's natural resources the most healthy in the land. We are. We are. We are. We are your Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. Fishing, hunting, wildlife management, resource protection, habitat conservation, public outreach, and education. It's what we do. It's what we live for. Simply put, Conserving wildlife literally means the wise use of wildlife. And that's at the root of everything we do. <coughs> Oklahoma is one of the most species diverse states in the nation. Making sure opportunities exist for hunters, anglers, and all those who appreciate wildlife is not only our job. It's our passion. We are your Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. From sunup to sundown, and sometimes all night long. The employees of our agency are relentless in their dedication to a job well done. The science behind wildlife conservation is constantly evolving. And our biologists are leading the way with groundbreaking and cutting edge techniques that the entire scientific community benefits from. If that's not enough to make you proud, then consider this. 
We've been doing all this since our agency's birth in 1909 without using a dime of taxpayer money. That's because the Wildlife Department is designed as a user pay, user benefit agency. It's sportsmen and wildlife enthusiasts who pay the bill for wildlife conservation. In three regular business meeting of the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation Commission. We're glad you're here. And we will call the meeting to order and roll call by Rhonda. Mr. Mabry. Mr. Deal. Mr. Barwick. Mr. Holder. Mr. Zelt. Absent. Mr. Dillingham. Mr. Case. Mr. Gatz. Here. Uh, if you'll please stand for the invocation by Nathan Erdman and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Please bow with me. Lord, thank you for being with us on the way in and grant us safe travels here and then watch over us on the way home today. Uh, during the meeting, please grant us the wisdom and the knowledge to make the decisions that we should for the best of the resource and the best for our customers. And grant us the wisdom and knowledge to protect our employees and keep them working for this great agency. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. J.D., would you please introduce our guest? Sure. Of course, we have Laura McIver here with Quail Forever. We should add you to our roll call. <laughs> um, James Deach, also with Quail Forever. Clifton McKenzie with the Red Bud chapter of Quail Forever. Uh, Juliana Lopez with OKC Latina. And Rick Grunman with the Wildlife Foundation here with us today. Man, that's a hot mic. <laughs> okay. We have some awards to present. Thank you. Yes, we do. We've got four today, in fact. And um, just as a refresher, um, we ask folks that have at least 20 years of service in with the uh, agency if they would like to come in. And so that's, um, uh, that's what you have before you today, at least 20 years of service. Uh, to the agency, and we'll start with our Assistant Chief of Law Enforcement, Wade Farrar. Started with us in March 2003 as a warden in Oklahoma County. Uh, transferred to Logan County in 2007. He was promoted to the District 5 Warden Supervisor in 2014. Became District Chief for uh, District 5 in 2017, and then promoted to Assistant Chief uh, in 2019 against my better judgment, but um, no, <laughs> happy. I'm so happy we made that promotion. Uh, married to his wife, Kelly, for 20 years, has two sons, Nolan, 14, and Lawson, 10. He's been on the Honor Guard since it started. He worked his way to commander of the Honor Guard, where he is currently in that position. I know it's one that he holds dear. He was also instrumental in helping set up and tear down for Expo for the entire time that we had Expo. Uh, bucked a lot of bales and so forth. Um, he was the department's representative on the emergency response team for the state of Oklahoma. Spent almost every archery event and state shotgun competition assisting them with his medic training from his time in the Air Force. Since being in the office, he's been instrumental in the switch over to electronic reporting, making sure all our paperwork has been adapted to electronic files. Of course, this was especially stressful in the midst of COVID uh, when it really changed the way the department did its paperwork overnight. Wade has always been one when asked to volunteer, he steps forward and he always does what's needed. Uh, he represents law enforcement division and the department in a very professional manner and goes above and beyond uh, always to be prepared for whatever challenges may arise. Um, certainly, no doubt, the law enforcement division is a uh, much more professional and smoother operation for Wade's efforts and his worth, work ethic and uh, invaluable member of our leadership team as well. So we want to congratulate Wade for 20 years of service.
Oh, well, I appreciate it. Um, that doesn't sound like me when you started reading all that stuff, for sure. Um, 20 years went by like that. Uh, when I took this, this uh, promotion in 2019, I figured um, time was going to drag by, and it went even faster since I, since I came to work up here. So I enjoy every day I get to do what I do. Um, I'm in a position now that I can make things better for, for those that are in the field where I used to be. And I just appreciate you guys supporting us like you do and uh, continue the battle. Thank you, Wade. Okay. What? You mean we don't just sit around and tap our pencils on the desk up here? <laughs> All right. Also, 20 years of service, Lieutenant Casey Young. Is he not here? Couldn't make it. Couldn't make it. Okay. I just thought uh, I didn't see him yet. So we will congratulate Casey when we see him. Next up for 25 years of service, we have David Technician Banta Banta. <laughs> He's a uh, wildlife technician at Hickory Creek in Love Valley, uh, hired on uh, May of 1998 as a technician at Warica Mountain Park, Fort Cobb, Washita County, WMAs. 2003, he transferred to Love Valley and Hickory Creek. Um, Kent Swanda was his first supervisor and uh, Banta can tell you how Kent literally tried to work him to death his first year as a as a test of his vigor given the reputation of those two guys I'm sure very few would have been able to to keep up on many individual weeks much less for a full year so everybody that uh, knew Swanda knows how true that is he's been involved with wet de wetland development unit management throughout his career He's as good as we have in the agency at Moist Soil Wetland Management. The WDUs on Love Valley had great food in 2022 despite the drought, and it had multiple units full of water on opening day of duck season. He's also an expert at prescribed burning. Snags across the central region fear David Banta and his steel chainsaw with its carbide chain. <laughs> I have no doubt. While not normal technician duty, Dave was the MC the last time department hosted CIFWA. He was the 2011 Wildlife Division Technician of the Year. He still works circles around those people half his age. He's a great ambassador for the agency to his constituents. He's an effective leader in the agency both in terms of a role model on work production and as a spiritual leader. Banta is locally famous for his homemade grape jelly and plum jelly. Amen to that. That plum jelly is spectacular. He also annually produces a profusion of squash. We won't say the Love County road crews have received kickbacks of these commodities, but we can say that Hickory Creek may have the best WMA roads in the state. On his workday account, he has listed as skills like human flag and walks on hands. He might even do it for you today if, you, if we uh, ask him to. He could do a demonstration and fake stumble on demand as well, so one of, some of his many talents. I will say he also came out of the spectacular graduating class of wildlife ecologists from Oklahoma State with the likes of Jerry Shaw and J.D. Strong. No. So we just made sure ahead of time that we weren't going to tell any college stories on each other because it's mutually assured destruction. Amen. Mostly for me. Congratulations for 25 years of service, David. Thank you. Listen, I've seen the agenda today, and there are obviously many items of much greater importance than this, so I'll keep it short and sweet. But I do greatly appreciate the recognition. And, you know, first and foremost, if you allow me, I just want to thank God because he's blessed me with his great career, good health, freedom, a wonderful family. The list goes on and on, and I owe it all to him. So that's where I need to start with. But I also want to thank my chain of command starting at the very top with our director, J.D. Strong, assistant directors, Wade Free, Amanda Stork. You know, under their leadership over the last several years, the ODWC has really become the envy of many, if not most, wildlife agencies in this great nation of ours, and that's highly commendable. You know, when J.D. came on as director, one of the first things he did was to implement 
an open door policy for employees at all levels. And I'm sure that's caused him a little heartburn from time to time over the years, but I want you all to know that that is highly respected in the field. In fact, I've approached that door a time or two myself over the years and found it to be wide open as advertised. So thank you for that, J.D. Of course, my chief, Bill Dinkin, assistant chief, Russ Horton. <laughs> I tell you, those guys untangle miles of red tape and jump through endless hoops to make sure that we are well supplied, that we have everything we need to carry out our mission and keeps us freed up to do what we do best and to do what we love and that's to manage wildlife habitat and to take care of our constituents. Then my regional supervisor who probably wrote that, Jeff Big Money Pennington, I know many of you know him. <laughs> but I'll tell you something, you'd be hard pressed to find a more dedicated or indefatigable employee in this entire department and I don't consider that to be hyperbole. He leads from the front. And then my direct supervisor, I got a lot of supervisors done. My direct supervisor, Brandon Baker, who manages not only Hickory Creek and Love Valley, but also one of our premier WMAs in the state, Cross Timbers. And you know, I'm sure you've heard by now, but at Cross Timbers this year, eight different kids were able to harvest a tom turkey. And that's really what it's all about. And lastly, but certainly not least, I want to thank each and every one of you commissioners, because as employees, we recognize your unwavering support for us, and we want you to know it does not go unnoticed, and it's greatly appreciated by us and our families, so thank you for that. And I'll just end by saying that it has been, it is, and it will continue to be an honor to work for this fine agency. Thank you. Thank you, David. Appreciate you. I'd just like to say if any of you have not been to the manage, wildlife management areas that David supervises and takes care of, you need to do, go down there. He lives on it. He treats it like it's his front yard. I'm telling you, good job, David. I mean, I appreciate your help on that. The only thing I'm disappointed about is you didn't bring us any jam. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, David. That All would be years. bribery of a commissioner, right? We can't. <laughs> No, class act as well as you just saw right there. So thanks, David. And thanks for not telling any college stories. Uh, for 30 years of service, we recognize Colin Bird today, who's a communications and education supervisor that started with the agency in May of 93 as a aquatic resource coordinator. Uh, 97, he moved to education supervisor, and in 99, uh, communications and education supervisor. So other information to share. Colin has been integral in changing the course of conservation education in Oklahoma and really across the nation as a pace setter, I would say, and I've seen it firsthand at the national level. About 15 years ago, he proposed a bold new idea that we call the campfire model. It was quickly adopted by the department and has since been copied in many other states. Simply put, the campfire model aims to spark the interest of the outdoors with kids and add fuel to the fire each year with continued exposure to new outdoor activities and programs. This model elegantly hurdles both obstacles. It not only introduces thousands more students than could be accomplished by agency employees, but it also provides repeated experiences for them, which we know is critically important to recruitment. In 2004, led by Colin Berg, the Wildlife Department introduced the first spark to the fire, the National Archery in the Schools program, as a pilot program to eight schools. That year, 500 students shot archery as part of their curriculum. The year was capped off with a state shoot for the eight schools in which 100 students participated. This year, more than 500 schools were involved with more than 50,000 kids participating. So. Based on the success of National Archery in the Schools and the demand for other outdoor curriculum during the 2009 school year, Bird spearheaded the effort to introduce hunter education into the classroom. Explore bow hunting and varsity archery quickly followed a few years later. It was this that spurred several teachers and coaches to convince their administrations to allow them to offer an entire semester of outdoor education. Demand for new curriculum grew and Colin and his staff responded by throwing another log on the fire and developed the Fishing in the Schools program in 2012. This added an aquatic resource angle to the students' outdoor education. Soon after, the Wildlife Department reinforced the aquatic resources curriculum by introducing Explore Bow Fishing in 2013. Finally, Colin and his colleagues created yet another success in 2014 with the Oklahoma Scholastic Shooting Sports Program. 
which trains students to shoot trap and is now in 120 schools. The success of these programs thrives on providing schools with curriculum and the equipment they need to teach it. And every, each year, 50 new schools are trained each year at a two-day event that provides equipment and curriculum for all five of these programs. The agency is teaching the teachers and giving students an experience that goes so much deeper than you would get out of a one-day fishing clinic. Today, the passion for the outdoors is burning bright in the hearts and minds of countless students thanks to the vision and dedication um, uh, to conserve uh, demonstrated by Colin Berg. At every step along the way, there were challenges to staffing, budgets, and a number of other problems that come with new programs growing by leaps and bounds. Colin never took the easy way out, but he's widely recognized as a leader in the community of conservation education educators. The campfire has now become a bonfire, thanks to Colin Berg, and we definitely appreciate you. And I know Commissioner Holder, for example, knows full well the, um, the power and reach of our nationally renowned Archery in the Schools program with uh, his own um, grandkids competing and winning and, and the show on the stage with national championship teams and individuals and with our most established programs and we know lots of other folks already getting scholarships through the Scholastic Shooting Sports Program, on and on and on. Um, we have Colin to thank for um, establishing and building uh, by far one of the best hunter education and shooting sports and, and fishing in the schools programs in the country. So for 30 years of service, thank you. Dad's a minister, remember that. <laughs> Commissioner Holder, I'm sure that's genetics, right, is what it all comes from. But congratulations to your grandson and to his entire team. That's pretty, pretty amazing. 30 years, Wade said 20 has gone by really fast. 30 is just like the next 10, Wade, you'll blink and your kids will be graduated and you'll be, what happened in the last 10 years? And so you probably won't see me another time for another pen. Um, I've already told folks that I'm on my way out the door in a couple years, less than a couple years actually, not that I'm counting down. I actually <laughs> have a lot of things to, that I wanna do and I wanna be able to, capable of doing them uh, when I do retire, stay engaged though through the agency. Times have changed. We had a, a, an event that we did last week, the c and &E Roadshow. And there were uh, a variety of folks from all divisions there at that road show. And in one of the presentations, I looked around and saw several interns that are currently working in our division. And I said, you know, when I started 30 years ago, you weren't even born. You weren't even born. You weren't around. There's only four or five that are in this room that I think were here when I started uh, four, uh, 30 years ago. I did an interview last week with Tess Monty. Um, Wade said there's stuff that's on his uh, list that was read off. There's things that are, J.D. read off on mine that 30 years ago I said, that's not me, that's not me. I don't want to be you know, in front of anybody on a mic. I sit in the back of the room, take notes, and go out and do my work, and uh, that wasn't me. I didn't want to be in the forefront. But as I told Tess, I said 30 years ago, we, one of the topics that we talked about in the five minutes that we had on Channel 6 live segment. Never would have thought I'd be on live TV, but I told her, I said, actually 30 years ago, almost the exact same date, I was in front of live TV, having been on the agency for about 13 days, <laughs> counting weekends, in, with Butch and Ben McCain. Anybody remember Butch and Ben McCain? And it was talking about free fishing days and Oklahoma being one of the first states in the country to implement free fishing days, and we talked about that. And, she just said, 30 years, man, that's why you know you can read the teleprompter and you know that it said five minutes, that's how long the segment is, and we talked about four subject matter areas, and I thought, 30 years ago, I'd have been lucky to get through one subject matter area. Mm -hmm. But it's been fun. These things didn't even exist really 30 years ago. They are good in some sense if you need help and can call, you, need, you can find somebody, but otherwise I would probably put them on an anchor and throw them in the water <laughs> <laughs> because people expect too much right away. Like if you don't respond, they think the worst has happened. You've been killed in a car wreck or something's gone wrong because he didn't answer his email, he didn't answer his phone for the last three days, where's he at? 
they are good and they are bad. Uh, there's a lot of things great about this agency that I love, I've enjoyed. Uh, it is one of the best in the country. I've, I've gotten to visit with a lot of folks from other agencies. The education stuff has been fantastic that I've been able to be a part of. I added it up, there's like 23 different staff members, full-time staff members that have worked in the education program since I became the supervisor. And somebody promoted me way before I was ready to be a supervisor. But some of the other things that I've done, prairie chicken stuff, different things that uh, interesting, actually being in Washington, D.C., and I don't like politics and talking to Congressional Sportsman's Caucus about lesser prairie chickens and <coughs> abstaining from actually listing that bird like 25 years ago when it was initially petitioned to be listed, working with landowners, engaging with all of our divisions, working alongside not just our communication and education staff, but all of our agency folks. That's the only way that we've been able to do what we've done is our quality staff that we've got across the state. David said it really well. You know, it's, I, I owe my background God as well. You know, it's carried me through a lot of things, a lot of change. Um, and I learned early on that if you are fearful of change, you won't change. So don't fear change. It's a good thing. It's time for me to step back and let somebody else take the reins because things are changing faster than I can keep up with. And it's a different world, different technology world. But I love working for the department. One of the few that actually said when I was a young kid that this is what I wanted to do and actually was able to become involved with the agency and have had a long career here. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Colin, can you uh, round up those winners and bring them before us so we can recognize them at, at a, one of our meetings? I think, I I think, think it's well deserved by them. That would be great. It's in the works. Okay. Yeah. Works. Pretty, pretty awesome seeing those kids do that well at the National Sheep. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Colin. Appreciate it. Thank, well, thank you. All. all right. So, um, item seven, we've got Nathan Erdman. Yeah, it's Nathan with Laura McIver this time. Yes, that's Bill. right. That's right. It's Nathan and, and Laura. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, commissioners, Director, um, it's my pleasure to be here today. Um, introduce Laura McIver, which everybody knows her. She should be just an honorary member of commission meeting day <laughs> up here every time. Um, but for a change, instead of Dinkins being up here introducing what they're going to give to Wildlife Division, I get to introduce what they're going to donate to law enforcement, which I've got my two wardens back there from Lincoln County and Pottawatomie County in District 5, so Barwick, that's in your area, um, for a generous donation of $5,000 for some thermal binoculars, um, which were very cool when we were checking them out in the office this morning. They have night vision plus thermal, so... Uh, it's going to be a great tool to aid in our enforcement and also in helping to locate anybody that's missing or a child or anybody else out there in the, at night. But it's, a, it's a great tool to be coming in handy. So, Laura, can you come up here? and uh, More specifically, it's the Red Bud chapter um, that raised this money and donated it to our warden. So I'd like to thank the Red <coughs> Bud chapter also. Uh, Laura, thank you. Appreciate that. Absolutely. So yes, I am delighted to be able to have the opportunity to recognize the fact that how much our organization actually appreciates deeply the work that our game wardens do. And so um, I am excited and was surprised when I got the email, but I was like, yes. <laughs> so um, this is Cliff he is part, uh, McKenzie. He is part of that chapter for the Redbud chapter. Lloyd Jones is the president. And he has, um, he's been in and out of state, um, working in Iowa to help with roofing families that got hit by tornado stuff, and including his own. So, um, and then Todd Ferris is the other principal person who has been, who helped drive this donation. And I'd like to read out loud, it's a long letter, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but what he, his last paragraph really emphasizes exactly why we do what we do, whether it's for habitat or on the flip side for wildlife in through the game warden department. So 
Thank you for the opportunity to provide this gift to the ODWC. It is our collective belief that game wardens are the frontline face of the OD ODWC to the outdoorsman's public and anything we can do to support their difficult job is a worthy cause. We appreciate making um, um, the ability to be able to um, make this donation and the it's listed here in here as he said it's got a unique ability to not do just thermal but also the infrared and as wade described it does both you can click a, a setting and it actually takes care of both it does both of those so it's pretty exciting so thank you to the red bud chapter i really appreciate that and gentlemen <laughs> use it <laughs> we hope it we really do hope it helps you guys out so thank you Thank you so much. I, this, you know, our law enforcement are frontliners, and that's so important. To have. You can switch. There's the equipment. When you go down more. All right. Everyone overlap shoulders if you will. All right. One more. Three. Here we go. One, two, three. Thank you again. Even though we do do, we appreciate you uh, everything you guys do. Thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah, I walked out of my office and they were scanning me across the office. <laughs> Thank you again so forever. And uh, do we have a motion to uh, accept it? So moved. Second. Bill Coffey. Commissioner Mabry. Aye. Commissioner Deal. Aye. Commissioner Barwick. Aye. Commissioner Holder. Aye. Commissioner Dillingham. Aye. Commissioner Kane. Aye. Commissioner Gaddis. Aye. All right, I know we nail for us, they'll start. <laughs> I'd wait. Commissioners, <clears throat> before I introduce Jennifer, let me um, tell you a little bit about our philosophy towards aquatic education. With limited resources, we have prioritized training and supporting local schools, organizations, and uh, to give them the equipment, skills, and confidence to host fishing events wherever and whenever works best for their community. For Jennifer's part, she's a, a com communication and education technician, and she has 16 years of full-time credit with the department. She did start um, under Collins' tutelage as an intern in Jinx. Um, and she focuses on providing assistance with our hunter education program, NASP, OKSSP, and she volunteered to coordinate this effort when we were first looking at applying for this grant with the Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation. And on a personal note, she has a family history of public service. Some of you will recognize her cousin's name, former Secretary of State and Statesman, Chris Binge. Yeah. Jennifer? Good morning. Good morning. See if I can figure this out. So, Vamos a Pascar is Let's Go Fishing in Spanish, and it is a grant that is, we partnered with the Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation to award a grant. They have a board that looks at applications and they will award funding to an organization to help reach Hispanic communities, usually in metro areas. Um, it is a one-to-one -one grant, so when they apply for the grant, half the money comes from RBFF, the other half will come from the department. Um, we started, I first found out about the program, I believe JD brought it to our attention in late 2019. So in 2020, we were able to get in touch with Juliana Lopez with OKC Latina. And she was very excited about getting into this opportunity. And so out of about 46 million anglers in the United States, only about 3 million, give or take, are Hispanic. So it is a very underreached area that 
I think were beneficial in trying to reach out to them. Uh, so in 21, 19, or 19, goodness, 2021, uh, OKC Latina was selected as, as about one of 16 organizations across the country to receive funding. Um, she went through our aquatic resource education training, so she is a certified aquatic ed instructor now. Um, she received a grant in 21 for the first year and hosted quite a few events throughout the year. Um, then in 2022, she applied again, but this time we also had Cedar Tell Park Foundation applied. Both organizations were selected for funding. Um, it's, it's very important that we, I guess, reach these communities since it's in decline. I guess we all know that. Uh, so we're, we want to reach more people, recruit more anglers. Um, of the events that Juliana hosted, they, uh, many of the families were either first-time anglers, completely the entire family unit was, or maybe the parents had fished when they were younger, but the kids had never fished. So this was, it was really encouraging, uplifting to see these kids catching their first fish, and even the parents would get so excited. Um, so she had a very successful year in 21, and then again last year in 2022. Um, she did apply for the grant in 23. We also had Cedar Hill Park reapply. Um, unfortunately, OKC Latina did not get the grant, but Cedar Hill Park did. But even though OKC Latina did not receive the grant for this year, they're still planning on hosting multiple events, particularly this fall. Um, and they're She's getting held to apply for the 2024 year, which will open in about November when the applications open. So people by attending those events, especially like the OKC Latina ones, the families are leaving with a new understanding and knowledge of the outdoors. Um, conservation and fishing that they might not have had the opportunity to be exposed to before, especially being in a metro urban setting it's not always a priority to get outside. And with our initiative of the outdoors are always open, this was a perfect fit for that to try to get, get some more families out there. Uh, we did encourage OKC Latina to require that her, the participants attend at least three events. Uh, each event they would build on the education they received before. So typically in an aquatic education event, it's a, usually a one-time deal, they learn safe casting, knot tying, fish identification, maybe over some ethics. So we took that typical class, did that the first session. Next session we built on that. We might have went over different types of lures, different types of reels, how to get your line untangled, how to get unstuck from a rock or a tree you might have hooked onto. And then we would also go over different lure types and all that. So each time they came, they learned a little bit something new. Um, and at the end of the third event they attended, the parents would go home with a fishing license provided by that grant for city and state, and they would also receive a loaded tackle box, and each member of the family would get a fishing pole. That way they could continue to fish after the event. Um, I feel Vamos a Pascar is a very worthwhile endeavor for us to participate in, since it's geared towards reaching a portion of Oklahoma's population that we have not always been able to reach. Um, and like all our events, it's not just limited to the Hispanic Latino community, it's open to all ages, all ethnicities, all abilities. So without any further ado, I'm going to introduce Juliana Lopez with OKC Latina. I kind of forgot to go through the rest of my slides. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there you go. Awesome, thank you. Well, if you would have told me when I started OKC Latina in 2019 that one of our signature events would be a fishing clinic, I would have laughed in your face because I had never even put a worm on a hook. But now I'm aquatic ed certified, so take that. Um, <laughs> Jennifer has been an incredible partner in putting on over a dozen fishing clinics that reach so many incredible folks in our community. And truly, I think the biggest uh, perk of this uh, grant and why it works so well for the community is that it is the one-to-one -one, uh, giving. So we know that it's not just some national organization 
that is giving us money, that has no connection to Oklahoma. It is the ODWC that is taking part in this, that is giving of its time, giving of its resources, and its folks. Like, I've met so many of you. Lance is our resident um, untangler, <laughs> um, if you will. Um, maybe if a turtle or two get caught. Um, I can't do that, so that's Lance. Thank you so much. Um, really, this is one of those programs that makes so much sense for the Hispanic and Latino community ni nationwide, but especially here in Oklahoma. We love being outdoors and spending quality time together. That is such a huge tenet of the community that I am part of. It is how I've grown up. You do cookouts, you go to the lake, you spend every holiday weekend you can outdoors. And to help folks do that in a time when, you know, we are on our cell phones a lot, we are really busy with life, but to get folks to come out three Saturdays in a row, take a few hours to fish, to learn a little bit about the community, and just have see the joy on these kids' faces when they're, if I can get this clicker, you want to scroll that for me? Um, the, to see the joy on their faces when they are catching these, when Jennifer's teaching them how to identify fish native to Oklahoma, the bluegill, the bluegill's a personal fave and uh, mm -hmm. a favorite of a lot of our folks here. That's what we seem to be catching at South Lakes or um, at Route 66 Park. And I, sh we even had a little girl coming from her, her dance recital straight to, mm -hmm. straight to a fishing clinic once and that family um, has come to a year's worth of clinic <coughs> um, right there on the right. And we just get to have the best time. And we did not receive this grant this year, but I am working with the entire uh, division for the events to be able to put on um, more, more fishing clinics that are not um, specifically sponsored by Vamos a Pescar, but that are sponsored by um, myself, community partners, and maybe even some fundings from the ODWC because that's how deeply they care about reaching my community and I could not be more grateful for those partners. So thank you, JD, for bringing this to the attention of uh, the division. Uh, I, I, it, it's, it's changed how we think that we can operate even. Um, we're looking at expanding our program to not just fishing clinics, but maybe introductory to just <laughs> outdoors. <laughs> looking at what are some plants that are, oh, hey, <laughs> let's talk. <laughs> but really, we've seen such an interest in the community for being able to just take part in something that is free and completely accessible. And I think that expanding into more youth-oriented programming, so um, having stuff for the families, but having stuff for the kids where they can just be kids, get a little dirty, we'll have volunteers come out, hang out with them in just the, the you know, the beautiful Oklahoma outdoors. And I think there's a, there's a lot of room for growth here. Um, and the fishing is really just the beginning of this. Our social media impact, if we want to get into those numbers, is huge. We've reached over with just posts about our fishing clinics and about the, the photos that we share. We've reached over 45,000 individual accounts. So that's just one account. And then how many people are those people telling? Um, we were able to give 33 um, city and state fishing licenses um, to one adult per group that attends three um, consecutive uh, fishing clinics gets to go home with that fishing license city and state and then again I mean we've partnered with Bass Pro have been a huge help in giving us like a little discount when we need to go and spend this grant funding Zebco gave us their family and friends discount we've worked with tons of folks we've worked with Lynn Institute um, which is a health and science research center that is here in Oklahoma City and works within the Hispanic and Latino community they gave us healthy snacks to be able to give out during this time outside and make sure that we're all staying healthy and um, able to continue doing this work. Um, really, this impact report is something that I can also send to the, to the commission if they'd like to see, and it's just a really big thank you letter to the ODWC and all of our sponsors. We've worked with the Oklahoma City Parks Office to um, waive some of those fees that maybe got in the way of getting some stuff done really quickly, so mm -hmm. we're really appreciative <laughs> for them. Um, I really... I could stand here forever and ever and ever and just spout like data or um, the fact that it's a real, we're just such an underserved community when it comes to outdoor recreational programming. But the the impact that is these folks have become my friends, 
folks that come to our fishing clinics are now huge supporters of the OGWC and of OKC Latina, and I tr that that's priceless, and that alone could keep us going, but knowing that we have the people power and the spending power within the Hispanic and Latino community, I want to get folks out here, I want to get folks buying hunting and fishing licenses, I want to get folks understanding exactly what it is that the OGWC does, and um, I think we're well on our way for that. But I'd love to take any questions if you have. Sounds or compliments. Awesome. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it sounds like a wonderful program and we really look forward to great things. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, and I just want to say thank you to you, Juliana, for taking a risk on us um, <laughs> yeah. as well and partnering with us because I know it, it is uh, daunting um, to think about, right? And, um, and that's been the problem for you know why we've kind of had this barrier between us and the Hispanic community, uh, not on purpose, but just because we didn't really have anybody to reach out to to start forging that partnership with. And, and so, you know, 2019, we didn't have that at all. And just a few years later, we've got this great partnership, thanks to you and your willingness to take a risk on us. And, and um, just can't thank you enough and look forward to uh, growing that interest even further going forward. Yes, well now, I, now I'm the less famous one from your social media. I, ha I have to be like, no, I knew them. I knew them before they were famous on social media. And <laughs> on Instagram, okay? So yeah. I, I get to claim that, but thank you so much. We really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs>
five-day, we had a 10-day, $20 in our license bill, and that was five-day, $15. Is that right? Yes, I believe so. Sorry, I am. Okay, so there was one bill that um, Chairman Appropriations Kevin Wallace um, ran through the session that, that put up this uh, five-day, $15, commercial hunt operation, upland game, not including turkey license, um, which again, we were proposing in our license bill to have a $20 10-day, so having a $15 five-day is maybe even better if they pass it at the end of the day. So that they have to, they want to go two weekends, they got to buy two of those. So, so uh, session is over, but we are still working diligently um, in regards to legislative matters. I can take any questions y'all have regarding this session. Hey, or Catherine, I have a question. What's the department's position on the velvet buck season? Um, the velvet buck, that legislation died in committee. And so what, what's our position? Director Strong? We were... Oh, hold it. Just wait a second. You don't know? I... I do know the position of the department. Um, the current legislation we had this session, we uh, worked with the author on it. Um, and if that bill had gone through, we would have promulgated the rules through the commission. But what's our position? Our position was that if it passed through the session as, as drafted, it would give the commission the ability to draft rules and regulate it. Although we also were, you know, following it closely to make sure, and, and again, at the point at when it, which it went down in the session, we no longer had to focus on it at that point. Well, the reason why I ask is that the author asked me what the department's position was. And you want to know what the reasons were for our position. So I'm trying to find out why he didn't know that. I worked with the author. He didn't know that. He did know that. I don't know why he would ask that. He asked me at the fish fry. I wanted to know the reason, so that's why I'm asking you. I would have been happy to jump in on that conversation at the fish fry. Um, so I apologize if but what, what? there was any confusion, um, but I did work Do with the we have author. a position on it? Some of these bills, we don't stake out strong positions early in the session okay. or even midway through the session because you never know what twists and turns they're going to take as they go. And sometimes it's a, it's a, it's a finesse job behind pretty, the scenes that's a that pretty specific uh, request for a bill with a velvet buck season. I mean, should we be against it? Should we be for it? I mean, now we have the opportunity to work with the commission through the rulemaking process to see what you all want to do about it, the way it turned out. So, And also, our constituents aren't on a monthly schedule. So could you keep us advised during the process of what's going on, significant developments? Like Absolutely. a vote out of committee, things like that. I'm happy because we get, we hear from our constituents on that, especially with the arrow rifle bill. So I would appreciate it if you could update the commission as it goes along, not just each month. Can, can we do that? Absolutely, I can begin doing that. Okay. Yeah, and you do uh, update the website after every deadline, which is kind of where the significant. But the commission is. shouldn't have to go to the website to find out agree, what's going agree on. Agree with that. Happy to happy to update you at whatever frequency you all would like to be updated. I'm just pointing out that in addition, for the constituents, they have the opportunity to go to the website and see every bill that's being tracked, where it is in the process, after every step in the process. Um, so I know she does a lot of work reaching out to. Um, all the organizations like Quell Forever, Laura could probably attest, email updates and making sure that their members know the availability of that list that they can track what we're tracking uh, every step of the way on the website. Any other questions? Any other questions for Catherine? Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. I will say, uh, yeah. Heck of a session to uh, cut your teeth on for sure. I told her at several points in the process that I uh, saw um, things that I haven't seen in many years happen at the legislature with chairman of committees bills going down and do not passes passing through committee and um, so she did great work navigating that and uh, we'll know much more about all the twists and turns in the process 
when the next session rolled around. Also heard lots of good feedback from legislators throughout and at the end of session of um, just reinforcement <coughs> that she's doing good work and they respect uh, the heck out of her over there, always responsive and, and meeting their information needs and that sort of thing. So she pretty much lived over there all session <laughs> long, even when I had to abandon her occasionally to go take care of other stuff. So good work there. In your uh, federal report from um, Brittany Preston, you'll see lots of activity going on at the federal level. Of course, you're hearing all about the, in, in this report, um, given the deadlines to get it in your packet and get it sent out by Rhonda, um, can be dated. The debt ceiling is a good example of that. That did, in fact, pass both the House and the Senate. And uh, so both debt ceiling relief and spending control uh, throughout that process. Um, lots of activity in House and Senate committees um, disapproving listings that will impact the state of Oklahoma, like the Lesser Prairie Chicken uh, listing. Uh, Senator Mullen, in fact, carried a uh, Senate joint resolution disapproving the Fish and Wildlife Service rule on the endangered spe uh, status of the northern long-eared bat. Um, and so all expectations are that President Biden will veto all of those resolutions and that the uh, listing decisions will likely remain intact given the small margins in both chambers i don't foresee there being any ability to override any vetoes there unlike what can happen here uh, you'll see some updates on hearings that have been held up there as well um, we are continuing to rebuild on um, efforts to see if we can get Recovering America's Wildlife Act passed, uh, taking another swing at that, working with a uh, new majority in the House and Chairman Westerman from uh, Arkansas will, it appears, be in the lead on that on the House side. Uh, so stay tuned for more on that. Um, also, activity ramping up on the farm bill side of things and uh, USDA appropriations bills You'll note in the appropriations bill for USDA, um, there was um, some uh, COVID relief fund pulled back and, and so, several other things there. So just let me know if you have any questions about that. On the state front, you've got the director's report. Um, this week, c &E Division will be having its annual meeting down in uh, Beaver's Bend and looking forward to going down and speaking there and spending some time with that crew. Uh, somebody did mention here before that uh, they had their uh, c and &E road show in Coweta uh, last week. Um, seems like oh, everything runs together, but uh, it's always a great opportunity for us, the rest of the agency to go up and learn, uh, kind of spend a day with C&E and learn all the things that they do um, for the state, for the agency, and the ways that they can serve the agency. And, and so they did a bang up job there. Senator Stevens, who represents that area actually stopped by, I think he happened to be in town and was driving by and saw a bunch of department trucks there and thought we forgot to invite him to something. So he jumped in to, to see what was going on and learned that it was an internal meeting and he didn't miss out on, he's probably looking for more fried fish, um, as good as <laughs> the fish fry was up at the Capitol. Um, similarly, <coughs> Fisheries Division will be having their annual meeting at Texoma towards the end of the month. Uh, again, um, always an opportunity for commissioners to attend these meetings and just let us know if there's any interest, at least you know, show up for a dinner or something if you have, have a chance. And I know several commissioners have taken advantage of that. Um, the July 3rd commission meeting will be canceled, sandwiched right there in the middle of a holiday. So, uh, and the WAFWA summer meeting, I know commissioners uh, Gaddis and Barwick are signed up for that, will be uh, hosted by Santa Fe this year. Uh, July 10th through the 14th. They always have a good track of meetings for the commissioners. Um, agency updates, you'll see administration division. I just wanted to point out in all the things being processed through admin division, there's been some questions in the past. You can see there an update on uh, the P card program, the purchase card program. That's always in the report, just the amount of, of um, money being processed through that as well as all the other accounts receivable, federal aid coming in, Lots of work in HR always with uh, right now 21 full-time positions open and 
interviews and screening and, and so forth going through that process. I remember a time of, I think about three years ago or so, we were up to like 45 vacancies at one point and we were, felt like we were drinking through the, the fire hose trying to get those filled. So IT, licensing, property, lots of stuff going on, continuing to um, stock fish across the state. I'll point out in the fish stocking list you see an inordinate, inordinately large number of uh, walleye being stocked, uh, 7.3 million fry in five locations across the state. Um, it's interesting, we've got, we have a, a number of these partnerships and trade of fish kind of programs, if you will, uh, across uh, between us and other states. So uh, we picked up and stocked 4 million walleye fry from Kansas Parks and Wildlife. Uh, staff also went up for a couple of days and assisted Nebraska Parks and Game with walleye broodstock collection efforts. And in exchange for that free labor, if you will, on our part, we brought back 4.2 million walleye eggs and 5.7 million sawguy eggs, uh, which is uh, another part of a trade that we do with Nebraska. So uh, those kinds of things are happening all the time. I don't know, unless we point them out, I don't know if you're always aware of it, but um, we trade fish back and forth with, with other states. They can rear um, some that, uh, easier than us and, and back and forth. Lots of stuff going on in C&E Division. Uh, you've heard a fair amount of that um, today, both from Collins' um, discussion as well as our uh, almost up a scholar uh, presentation, but um, it's worth pointing out that Todd Craighead, who is also from that awesome class of wildlife ecologists from Oklahoma State at the same time, Jerry and Dave, mm -hmm. um, he was recently presented with the Conservation Medal from the Cordelia Steen Chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution for his lifetime of bringing conservation to the people of Oklahoma, so well-deserved uh, award for um, Todd. I um, flipped them through here. I know Gina Damel um, had a successful launch on online citizen science project called iNaturalist, on iNaturalist called uh, See, Share, Science a Thon. Uh, we had 500 participants, 4,000 observations, and 1,200 species identified. I know I even got in on the action this year and took a couple of uh, lunchtime walks around and and took pictures of and logged all the species I was seeing from birds to turtles to snakes. So always a great uh, to get all of our folks around the state plugged into helping us identify species and where they exist. Uh, wildlife Division, um, I might see if Bill's got the latest numbers on how turkey season wrapped up or if you can look it up. I just kind of threw it your way at the end here. but. Uh, though, for those that, you know, during the rulemaking process, uh, there were some proposed duck blind drawing um, changes on the table that were pulled back in the rulemaking process. I was just, just an update on that, that we continue to work internally to see if there are any um, changes warranted and how we do that system on the handful of reservoirs over in eastern Oklahoma where we still have a uh, show up for a physical drawing, but the plan is to, to have that yet again this September. Um, as it's always been done, and then we'll see if, um, work with the commission to see what modifications we may need from there. Um, as part of the ongoing turkey research, turkey tissue samples were collected and will be submitted for DNA testing. Um, and I thought it was an interesting report from far s southeast Oklahoma. The, there's continued interest in touring Red Slough Wildlife Management Area. Uh, year to date, they've had 37 tours, 165 people, including the Oklahoma Conservation Commission, four university college groups, two FFA groups, numerous individuals, 16 states represented, uh, so lots of folks um, hopping down to Red Slough to tour that place, and it, it's an amazing you know, area to see non-game, especially migratory bird species, alligators, um, so on and so forth. So. Uh, several in this, uh, on the commission, uh, went to the uh, Hackberry Flat uh, Crawford Building dedication a couple of weeks ago, and so thanks to Wildlife Division for getting the place all ready and cleaned up and, and uh, ready to go for that event. Um, and you can see a picture there from their 
annual meeting that they already held down at uh, Cross Point at Lake Texoma, May 17th and 19th. So it was great to go down there and, and spend some time with the Wildlife Division folks and speak to that group as well. Law enforcement, we had 11 wardens attend first responder chaplain training. In this day and age, of course, you have um, lots of additional stress and, and so forth on the law enforcement community. And, and so we were glad to see that Zach Polk and Joe Alexander and Carlin Bailey, David Garrett, Logan Shemp, Mark Hanna, Zane Arnold, Billy Bob Walker, Brandon Lerman, um, Philip Cottrell and Mike Baker all went through that first responder chaplain training in Tulsa. So they'll be available to counsel other officers, including our own, as they go through um, stress and, and PTSD and a number of other things. And then finally, I know um, Commissioner Gaddis uh, was there, but the District 2 wardens put on a great fish fry and retiree dinner for uh, the for the actually at the same time that the new recruits were going through the uh, Game Warden Academy out at Camp Gruber. Uh, that happened a few weeks back and, and sure appreciate your attendance there and showing your appreciation for the wardens. And uh, over the weekend, the Game Warden Association had its annual banquet over in Glenpool and thanks to Commissioner Mabry and his dad for showing up for that as well. So. Uh, with that, I might see if Rick's got an update on the foundation activities, and I'd be happy to answer. I, I have questions. a question for Bill. Bill, how long has the turkey research been going on? It'll be our second year, second trapping season. When can we expect an uh, update on your research? I can send you, uh, we get periodic updates from the students, and uh, the southeast are very good right now. Not much nest incubation going on, a lot of predation. Southwest is a little bit better, but I'll, I'll back and forth on this to the commission. Okay, I, I would appreciate that. Just uh, collecting tissue samples doesn't tell us a whole lot. And that is a five-year, three million dollar project. Yeah, so it'll be. And you brought up the turkey numbers, there, well, if I may. The, the harvest is up. I just don't have the exact numbers to present today, but. Harvest was up this year. The spring harvest. I think. Did I see something uh, on the wildlife updates? through even maybe Facebook where there was some info sent out because I read something about the turkey yeah about there the, was a, I yeah. saw some social media stuff on it and then I, I started wondering where that information came from so I actually went on the department's site and looked it up and saw that you know you can accurately go on there and look at it and see that's yeah. how they got their information <laughs> yeah because some of it was kind of detailed probably what we're wanting to see uh, but I've written that you do what now? Okay, thank you. Yeah, he did an article on it. Yes. Hey, Commissioner, I know in the central region, we were up 21% over last year on the overall turkey harvest this year, and up 20% on the WMAs in the central region. Yeah, there you go. Probably be good when we, I think we'll go final on all those numbers and have them scrubbed and be confident in them that maybe at the next meeting we can give a region by region blow by blow of the turkey harvest and see where it was up and see where it was down and, and that sort of thing. Rick? I wanted to start by saying thank you, commissioners, for your involvement and participation in the inaugural uh, Oklahoma Wildlife Conservation Foundation clay shoot. Uh, we have a a gift that went to all the participants on the desk in front of you. There is a straw inside that goes <laughs> inside here. And when I first got them, I thought I had purchased effective merchandise. For some reason, it doesn't work very well without a straw. So I would encourage <laughs> you to put the straw in there. And it's probably just because of my user error that I share. But thank you very much for your participation and involvement. We, uh, for an inaugural event, we raised in excess of $20,000, so it was a great initial event. And uh, didn't realize, we realized at the time it was Mother's Day weekend that we were setting it up, but we didn't realize that every university and uh, high school in the state were doing graduation that weekend as well when we secured the date. So I think uh, there's opportunity, quite a bit of opportunity to grow this just by picking a date that everybody doesn't have a conflict in. Uh, but a very positive kickoff. The uh, go to Hackberry Flat. We were the foundation was actively involved 
uh, in supporting the, re the refresh of the, the building and the, the renaming and dedication of the Bill Crawford building. Uh, roughly 70 to 80 people uh, attended the event. It was a great uh, opportunity for people to see the, the building and to recognize Bill Crawford for all the work he did in pulling that together. Uh, at the event, we were able, the foundation was able to announce that we've made a $75,000 contribution to the department to secure a three to one grant to begin the engineering and planning study for the bringing water back to Hackberry Flats, which is an exciting announcement. And we also announced that we will be launching a capital campaign to raise funds uh, for that, which is also eligible for a three to one match. And we have already secured uh, six figures of contributions without having formally put out material and hope to uh, to reach our goal of three million plus dollars to secure the $12 million needed to bring water back to Hackberry Flat in the not too distant future. Stay tuned, more to come on that. Uh, have some exciting information. We've been working, uh, Colin, myself, and Damon have been working with the Midway USA Foundation for a couple plus years now, looking for opportunities on how we can support, better support uh, youth shooting sports in Oklahoma and uh, we are excited to announce that we are working with Midway USA Foundation that we uh, are launching an endowment that will we hope to have uh, pretty significant news on that. Uh, there was a deadline for people to participate uh, at the end of last week and we're waiting for the numbers but uh, it's going to be a very significant impact to Oklahoma youth shooting sports that we'll be able to announce uh, in the very, very near future. But very exciting opportunity. You, you haven't heard anything, Colin, have you? Very high, yeah. Um, hopefully you've received your Save the Date cards for the, the gala. If you did not receive that, if you could... If you wouldn't mind letting me, Rhonda, or myself know, uh, because we sent out uh, approximately a thousand Save the Date cards a, a couple weeks ago for the gala, which will be Sept Friday, September 29th at the Omni in Oklahoma City. Uh, and we're looking forward to that. And we've already secured our first sponsor for that and look forward to an exciting event there. Uh, And uh, finally, wanted to wrap up with uh, the Oklahoma Game Wardens Association has been kind enough. They have donated a, a Game Warden firearm serial number one to the foundation to be auctioned off as a fundraising tool for the foundation at the gala and really appreciate uh, the Game Wardens Association and involvement in that. It's, uh, it's very rewarding to see that they're starting to see the benefit of some of the things that we've done and we'll be announcing some other contributions and involvements that we've been involved with in, in the near future. But are there any questions in deference to that? On that, on that uh, firearm that you've given away, given away uh, is that any caliber or the specific caliber or is, is it a caliber of choice? I believe it's a 5.56. Five, yes. It's serial number one and it has been produced and I was a uh, in conversation with the Game Wardens Association last night as we look at the federal firearms license transfers. And, uh, Thank you. Appreciate that. that. That's very nice. Wow. Who, who's the architect of that, Nathan? The name of that company. It is. I don't remember the name of the company, but um, the board, you know, the association board put the deal together, and Blake Pearson worked very closely with the design to get it off the ground. Well, we appreciate that. Yes, yes. The foundation appreciates that. We need all the help we can get. <laughs> uh, I will tell you who it is in just a moment. I'm trying to pull it up. There it is. Foley Defense. 
is the manufacturer of the of the, the platform, the rifle. I've seen it. It's pretty slick. Exciting. <laughs> I want one, but I'll pay for it. No <laughs> giveaway. <laughs> Any other questions? If not, thank you for your time. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Rick. Real quick, by the way, I think you all probably read the um, Upland Update, which um, is a monthly, I think, update of all things going on with Upland game across the state, and that would have had an update on the turkey research. So I made sure Mike is going to check and make sure all the commissioners are signed up for that email that comes out with regular Thanks. updates on turkey, quail, all things Upland. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right, the next two agenda items, we have Amanda Stork, please. Good morning, commissioners. I was joking that um, this time of year is really exciting for me that I need some walk-in music. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know, Rocky or something like that. I don't know. It's um, pretty exciting. Um, but first, um, we have the financials for your consideration. So this is for the period ending April 30th, 2023. Um, our first report is the combined balance sheet of all fund types and account groups. Um, as of April 30th, our liabilities and fund balance is $493,100,509. And of that, our total liabilities is $22,190,333. Our next report is the combined balance sheet for April 30th, 2023. Our extendable trust fund balance is $30,915,384. Our non-extendable trust fund balance is $102,437,378. Our pension trans trust balance is $125,558,577. And our defined contribution trust is $6,969,724 for a total of $265,881,063. And that's compared to last year of $269,078,308. On our combined statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance for all fund types, through April 30th, 2023. Our revenues are $45,566,445 and our expenditures are $45,894,846 for a total deficit of $328,401. Um, so our fund balance as of April 30th is $52,887,217. Slightly up from last year. Our combined statement of revenue expenditures and changes in fund balance for our trust funds. Um, our total operating revenue is $17,940,736. Operating income, $10,016,983. And our net income of the same. Our fund balance beginning is $224,948,696. And our ending is $234,965,679. For our trust funds. And then our March and April combined contributions report total $87,577.38. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Yeah, Amanda, on the uh, contributions report, who's the Orange Bison Company? I know them. Uh, it's a archery outfitter in Stillwater, based in Stillwater. It's a couple of guys that are with the OSU Alumni Association that um, run that business, and they worked with me really starting a couple of years ago to get Oklahoma on the map for the Total Archery Challenge. So that's why last year was the inaugural event, um, and this year they had their second event down at Beaver's Bend State Park, the Total Archery Challenge. 
Uh, I'm sure Dallas participated in it. Yeah, oh yeah. And there were probably several others in the room I don't know about, but man, it was huge turnout, great for the economy of Ho Chi Town. Not that they needed much more help on their economy down there, but um, that's what that company does. That's a very good donation. Yeah, they, well, so that was a fundraiser they held at the event. I think it was like a dinner concert thing that they held there with all the proceeds going to the foundation. Or to the department, I guess. Yeah, sorry. So in between agenda items, I'll go ahead and give you an update on our license license update for May. Um, our recreational licenses was up 7% from May 2022. Our resident fishing is up 11%. Resident hunting is down 17%. Resident combo is down 30%. Non-resident hunting is up 29%. Non-resident fishing up 12% non-resident one day up nine percent and then lake texoma permits are up seven percent lifetimes were slightly up by four percent for regulars and 13 percent for seniors I didn't think about it till now but let's just add that to the director's report from now on just so they'll have it in writing and won't be scrambling to yeah so i give it to her for the notes but it's like as of today so right. i try to because if i do that it's like a little bit late but even a couple of weeks yeah. delay will be okay, cool. good. And you might get with Kelly because I know he was frantically trying to write that all down. Okay. <laughs> oh, he's got it. Okay. It's yeah. recorded. It's like I try to get and the, you can go back and watch the YouTube video. Today. You want budget? Uh, I think so. uh, I move uh, to approve all the con contributions. There's a number of them on there, so that's really good. Great. Very good. Okay. Any discussion? Awesome. Roll call, please. Commissioner Mabry. Aye. Commissioner Beal. Aye. Commissioner Barwick. Aye. Commissioner Holder. Aye. Commissioner Dillingham. Aye. Commissioner Kane. Aye. Commissioner Gaddis. Aye. All right, Amanda. <laughs> hey, this is when I need my walk-in music. Um, <laughs> so the FY 2024 budget, um, as before you today, so I'll give you some highlights and then we'll go through some details. Um, our overall budget is $57,244,099, excluding capital expenditures. Um, that's increased slightly from last year. And then our overall budget, including capital expenditures, is $78,201,155, which is a decrease of 22.6% over last year. Um, in that figure, I um, things that were reconciled after the end of the process, after our finance committee meeting was held, um, it will be an additional 132000 on top of the 78201000 that That won't be reflected in your PowerPoint presentation, um, but we can get into that here in a minute. Um, so our budget preparation timeline this year, we kicked off in April. Um, we have divisions working starting at the beginning of the month, entering zero-based budgets. Uh, we have personnel budget that we have targeted for entering since that's a large portion of our um, expenditures every year. We start trying to estimate revenue um, in middle of April, try to wait till the end of April to get a better picture um, of our revenue, but we start looking at um, prior year obligations. Uh, then we analyze where we're at. Um, we get with the divisions to see is there any room for add-ons at all. Um, if there is any room, we have a deadline of May 10th for those. Um, we finalized the budget this year, May 17th, so that I could get the information to the Finance Committee on the 18th, and we had a Finance Committee on May 25th. This year, we also had a pre-meeting with Finance Committee in April um, to kind of see if we were in, going in the right direction, if they had any directions for us before we got to the end um, and needed to make changes at that time. Um, so we met on the 25th and then presenting this to you today. So this is the overall picture of the 22 budget, the 23 budget, and the 24 budget in the right-hand column. Um, our total budget for salary and benefits is $32,597,115. That's an increase of 3.6% over last year. For operations, um, our budget is $24,646,984. That's an increase of 5.9% over last year. Um, and then our capital expenditure budget 
is $78,201,155, which is a decrease of 22.6% over last year. Um, I'll take this moment to remind you that we had a, a large um, item in our budget last year that didn't end up getting um, funded, so it reflected in our budget, but it wasn't expended. Um, so that was the Cimarron Valley land purchase that was included, and that's why it was the 22.6% um, decrease. For um, the budget we're presenting to you for 2024, um, admin budget for the year will be slightly higher. Um, increases in that budget are two small items. We had cell phones and computers that have to be destroyed, and that costs us per device. Um, so we're in the process of switching out a lot of the laptops and computers, and so that will be a, an expense. Um, and then also our servers need to be replaced and there's some freight costs related to the server replacement. So it's an $18,000 increase um, in administrative division line item. And as a reminder, IT is included in admin division and it's pulled out of all the divisions. Um, for the wildlife division, they have a budget proposal of $17,600,301 that involves a lot of maintenance and equipment at WMAs. The list is too long for me to write out, but I'm sure that Bill will be happy to go into the details if anybody needs those, um, and we will get into uh, some detail a little later on. Um, fisheries division, their budget will be $12,099,397. That includes several reallocations of positions and also a grant for invasive carp um, that wasn't in the budget for last year. We are also proposing in this budget to eliminate the um, caviar sales, which will free up state dollars in order for us to match those dollars with federal dollars. So um, overall, the caviar sales were declining and we would get better return on our investment if we could focus statewide on paddlefish research rather than um, producing uh, caviar and that will give us a three to one match on federal funds that we did not have prior. Uh, in law enforcement budget, um, they're proposing $14,021,173. This includes new radios um, for several of our game wardens and also geosafe and electronic ticketing, which um, shows up in admin's budget because of how we have to budget it, um, but their add-ons were for electronic ticketing and also geosafe. Um, and then communications education, slightly up, we did have an employee move from administration division to communication education for um, human dimensions when we did a little bit of a, a shuffle and then they also have a new employee that is for um, shooting range coordinator. So that's why it looks like um, actually, they're a little bit flat, yeah. Um, $3,801,280. So total for operations for all the divisions is $57,244,099. Um, like I said before, capital refunds and transfers, $20,957,000. So our grand total, $78,201,155. Our revenue summary report, um, our non-spendable revenue that we bring into the agency um, under lifetime license sales that comes into the agency and then we transfer it to BOK into our investment account so we have to show it coming in and going out and as well as our senior lifetime so that 3.2 million is a placeholder in the budget to bring in the money send it out our spendable revenue um, total is seventy three million seven hundred sixty three thousand eight hundred eighty nine dollars um, that includes license sales other wildlife sales ag and oil lease grant revenues, um, slightly down because of that money that we budgeted last year for the land purchase. Um, interest income of $6,289,335. So the finance committee had us look at um, interest that was earned on the expendable or the trust fund over the last 10 years. And the amount of interest average over the last 10 years was $6 million. So they asked us to budget no more than the interest that's being earned on a 10-year rolling average um, with 
two years that were anomaly years. Um, so six million is what we've budgeted in this budget for our extendable portion of the lifetime license trust fund. Um, miscellaneous income, a little over three million, and then sale of fix, fix, fixed assets, that's our vehicle and machinery uh, auction that we do with Purple Wave, um, $800,000. And then I think I have a couple of, oh, okay. Um, so here it kind of all is our budget, the lifetime license transfer refund, the budget without that included, so you can kind of see that, that in and out. Um, our total estimated unobligated funds is $832,834. So of that, um, only $3,073 is general use unobligated funds. So that's our funds that we can use for anything. So $3,000. Um, I also had a prop for that, but it's probably not appropriate. And um, our unobligated funds with restricted use and statute is $829,761. And so we hold five funds here at the agency. They all have specific um, statutory requirements for what those can be used for. And um, we've budgeted to meet those statutory, statutory requirements. Um, revenue detail in your packet if you do need to see what the other wildlife sales or ag and oil lease, all of the individual revenue sources that make up those figures. I have those in your packet. Um, individual grants that make up the total grant figure. Um, interest income on those funds that we hold here and then also the lifetime interest there where there's six million dollars. Um, miscellaneous income there, what all that is made up of and then our sales. And then we'll have uh, 1.2 million of unextended 2023 funds um, that will carry over into next year. Our proposed capital expenditures, um, I'm going to have these up. I'm happy to answer any questions about individual ones or the divisions can, but they're grouped. Um, the first one there at the top are all of the shooting and archery ranges. Total budget is $3.2 million. Of that, $505,000 is state or license dollars. That gets reimbursed um, $2.7 million federal and then $45,000 other, which is match in this case. Um, voting access projects, the total is $1.6 million, no state or license dollars, all federal reimbursement um, there for voting and fishing access, and then Arcadia repairs, um, we have a total budget of $180,000, $90,000 of that is state license dollars, and $90,000 is federal reimbursed. Our various um, habitat projects and renovations. Um, so habitat, there was a list of 17, to 17, close, close to 17 um, projects that totaled 2.78 million, um, no state dollars, 2,085,000 federal and 695,000 other. Um, our renovation projects, there's Several there with several different divisions represented. 5.7 million of that 510,000 is state, 4.3 is federal, and 915 is other. And then we have three lands, uh, 1.4 million total, 56,914 state, 1.3 fed, 89 other. And then land leases, 1.8 million. 500,917 state, 1.3 million federal. So bottom line here is 16,907,000, total of which 1.7 is state um, license dollars, 13.5 uh, million is federal dollars, and then 1.7 is NERDA uh, match other sources of revenue. So, um, Amanda, I might just point out on that page too, on the bottom line, um, you know, as we talk every year about budget constraints, um, biggest limitation in leveraging all the federal dollars we have available to us is coming up with non-federal match. Um, and so I thought it was pretty remarkable to look at a budget where only 10% here of the overall cost is coming out of state dollars and trying to, you know, do everything we can to leverage uh, that fourth column over 
um, even more than more state dollars than we're putting in. It's more um, partner dollars, um, grant, donated dollars. Um, we still have a fair chunk of um, NERDA funds that we got from the Secretary of Energy and Environment's office that will, I think, be spent up and after this budget. But um, anyway, it's uh, you know there's a lot of work going on in the background. All the Amanda and her team and all the chiefs and, and assistant chiefs and, and their staff um, doing everything possible to stretch those dollars to, uh, to make budget. Yeah, I want to take this opportunity too to thank Lindsay. Um, she herded the cats and herded them nicely and also um, this year I think we had a pretty smooth process so um, I'm, I'm appreciative of the divisions as well for working with us to get this completed. It's a monumental task and I thank Lindsay a lot for helping. Um, so last item, I just wanted to mention, go back to this page so it'll make sense. Sorry, it felt like there was more slides. Um, of the 32,597,000 in our salary and benefits budget, um, this includes a 3% increase for employees and a 1% COLA for retirees. Um, the 1% COLA will be uh, effective January 1, 2024, and we'll be paid half in this fiscal year and half in next fiscal year, so 500000 um, obligated in this budget and 500000 will be obligated in next year's fiscal year budget. Happy to answer any questions. Yeah, Amanda, on the uh, general question on the grant revenue, it's down 23%, so it's about 15, 16 million. Why is that? That was the land purchase, so we budgeted increase in grant dollars last year um, to make that land purchase that we didn't end up purchasing. So it's not um, necessarily a decline in revenue that's available to us, but we had to budget that much last year for that land purchase. Um, had we had more funds available state dollar wise to match, we would have been able to budget more federal dollars that were available. But the big difference is the Cimarron Valley Ranch up in the Panhandle. That was that a was big grant we plugged in last last year's right. budget. Yeah. It's twenty four million dollars. So that was um, six million of that was a partner match and then the rest was federal, so it was an eighteen thousand dollar decrease just in um, that one budget item. 18 million. Do, do you remember how much uh, we contributed to the Panhandle State shooting range? Um, I'm going to look over of, there and see. That project was just south of 2 million, wasn't it? I was going to say maybe 2.25 or 2.3. Well, I notice we're spending 1.8 million at Atoka for a shooting range. Is that going to be a pretty good facility like Panhandle State, or what, what's going on down there? Uh, well, those ranges have been increasingly expensive. Um, the two most recent ones went from, or the three most recent ones that we just awarded and did construction on, they went from 300000 to 600000 to CAW, which is a million dollars, essentially. So we're, we're going with an estimated cost that's being provided by an engineering firm. That's, what they that's, that's way and above all the other shooting ranges. Yeah, so one reason that jumps out, I think, in the budget, because it jumped out to me and I asked staff about it, most that's the only range construction <coughs> project in the capital expenditures list. Is that correct? Optima. Optima, also. okay. Optima is just a two-lane a two lane shooting range, essentially. Yeah, so the rest of those are engineering and planning grants to get them ready for construction, so that's why they are so much less. So all, all those shooting ranges are going to cost about $2 million each? If the current estimation trend is going, it's looking that way, yes. Wow. Fortunately, we'll, be in, we'll soon be able to take advantage of the new 90-10 match um, money that Congress has provided for shooting range. So but a TOCA range, the construction of that is actually, at some point in time during the construction phase, we will move to 90-10 on that grant block. And that grant block has like um, three, I think three un uh, unfinished ranges in it. So Don't we have stock plans for those ranges or not? Essentially, it's a, it's a template and then it's customized because every site is different based on the topography, geography, et cetera. Can you, can you give the commission a breakdown? Of, not right now, but of the plans and everything at Atoka, I'd be interested to see that. 
the big item, big item that's different there is they're having to haul in a lot of dirt for the berms. So the dirt hauling is really the big change and the difference between Kaw and Anatoka. Uh, more fill dirt having to come in, yeah. Expensive. It is expensive to haul dirt, yes. And Amanda, I noticed that uh, we're paying $2.2 .2 million for computer programming. Is that branch fee? No, um, that is, we're in the middle of a migration from people, or from our internal BTG system to PeopleSoft, and we're having to pay contractors to migrate us from our internal system to that system. So that's kind of a one-time thing? Yeah, it's one-time. And one -time the reason we're doing that is because we're required so to by the... No, um, our system was put in in 1999 or 2000. It's no longer supported. Um, it is not integrated with the state's system, so we're having to do a lot of dual entry, and we don't have a fully functioning workflow process, and we wouldn't be able to have one with the system that we're in. It's not the company's out of business. It can't be upgraded or changed. Um, so we are transitioning to one platform where we can have um, seamless workflow for all the way from APAR to grants to billing, um, inventory, asset management, so that it's all in one place. Um, so that we're in the process of doing yeah, right that. And now we've got all that data and information coming through this archaic 20-year-old system that was custom built really for the agency. And like she said, really inefficient because they have to double enter a bunch of information that if we go we migrate to the to this state system essentially uh, the state software package then it's one entry it all flows through everything we got to report and turn in to, to the state just flows right through that system so it'll definitely improve efficiency in accounting federal aid and, and IT and inventory and several other places okay. Uh, we have um, one resident expert of the existing system, which is not ever a good position to be in, um, and it's difficult to get information in it, difficult to get information into it. Um, so the system that we're going to is actually, the reason why we're having to pay to do it is it's not just this, um, the system that the state gives state agencies to use, it's the phase two. Um, it ha it's, has more modules and it's something that not all state agencies use or need. So we're having to um, pay to pay somebody to do that. We did budget some of that in this year's budget, which it didn't end up fully completing. So we'll, the majority of it will be next year and we'll launch in March of 2024 okay. into the new system. I also noticed that we're spending almost a million dollars on a voting access at uh, Lake Vixoma. Um, okay. How come that's so that's on the capital improvements list. Again? Yeah. So basically, that in turns uh, replacing uh, two boat ramps and then creating two additional ones. Also, we're trying to allocate uh, the entryways in from the south and north and create a trail also around that for the constituents there at Vixoma. The beauty of those boating access projects is that we don't. Have in the dime of state dollars on. So those partners, right. whoever's so partnering. The city of Vixoma is, is coming up with the match. So they're paying it's 20. still taxpayer money, though. So we're just curious as to why that's, that's so expensive. 75% of that's voting access funds. I mean, that's my question. Why is it so expensive? So. Yeah, we've had much more expensive ones than that. The Grand Lake project, Wolf Creek, to attract the Bassmaster Classic, that was well north of $3 million on that project. I understand that, that one. But where is Lake Vixoma? About a mile and a half from my house. And <laughs> is, that, is, that why, is that why the voting access is increasing? <laughs> Honestly, that lake is a, it's an old water supply lake. It's very clear. It. And you go there any night of the week, and I swear to God, half of Tulsa is on that lake. It's become an incredibly popular paddleboard, sideboard, kayak uh, kind of lake. So you're saying this is long overdue? Yeah. What, what, what's it like right now? What kind of boating access do you have now? Old ramps and uh, yeah. Don't put a rookie on your in your truck backing your boat in. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's surprising how many big bass boats you'll see. It's trolling motor owner. It can't only you can't run a motor boat in, but uh, 
guys are out there. <laughs> they're bass boats all because there's some big bass in there too. So uh, yeah, it's a nice place. But it, it, especially 2015, 2019, and the floods, the big water events, huge erosion problems, and uh, yeah, it's just it's in rough shape. So as much traffic as they get. So. Yeah. I appreciate that insight. Y'all should come out. Yeah, <laughs> appreciate the insight. Uh, and also, I noticed our contributions are down from 6.4 million down to 400. Is that NERDA funds or? No, that was the contribution that we budgeted last year for the land purchase. We were going to get $6, six million dollar donation for the Cimarron Valley Ranch. Who's that from? Well, Pheasant Forever was going to help fundraise it. They were going to pitch in That's a the bunch. Rocky Mountain Health Foundation. Yeah, yeah. RMEF. And there was talking of BU. There were several that were. We're partners that were in part of that. Yeah. Yeah. So I probably and NIFWIF, you you know about the NIFWIF grant program. They they were kicking in a million dollar grant, I think. Yeah. I just feel like I should say on the microphone that that wasn't money that we had in the bank, um, and that any money that we would have received from the federal government for that would have been on a reimbursement basis. So that money is also not in the bank. Yeah. Your wish list. Yeah, I wish it was, but. It was a budget item that had to be there for the, in the event that we were able to, to do that. So it's not money that we have in the bank. Yeah, it's an important distinction because there were some rumblings of, well, you didn't end up spending $18 million on Cimarron Valley, so why can't you spend it on? <laughs> it wasn't in the bank. Fill in the blank, whoever we were talking to at, the, at that point in time. It doesn't and work that way. doesn't work that way. <laughs> budgeted, but we can't get the grant if we don't spend the money. So. Right. <coughs> Okay. Any other questions or conversation? Uh, I'd like to say something. Uh, as Amanda mentioned in the beginning, the finance committee was more involved this year than we normally are in the budget <coughs> process just because of some of the things that's been going on on our revenue side. And uh, as a chairman, I want to read a statement uh, on behalf of the whole committee that after we went through this process. but. The Finance Committee met and reviewed the budget proposal. What was clear from this process is our expenses continue to outpace our revenue, which leaves us on an unsustainable path. This shortfall each year has to be taken from our expendable portion of our lifetime license fund just to meet the basic expenses of the department. The portion of expenses covered by the trust fund is increasing each year. When this rainy day fund dries up, we will have no choice but to start cutting services to our sportsmen. We would like to commend each of the departments for finding ways to maintain and even cut expenses in the face of runaway inflation. They have done so without sacrificing the experience of our fishermen and hunters, but it does come at the expense of many capital improvements that need to be made and, and repairs on our equipment. Our biggest regret is that we can't pay our employees what we know they deserve. We want to make it eminently clear this proposed 3% raise was not merit-based, but one made on as a result of budget restraints. It remains a goal and priority of ours to pay market competitive salaries to all employees of the department. In lieu of this, we have asked the staff to provide us with funding needs for the short-term and long-term capital improvements, as well as what funding would be needed to get our salaries at a competitive level. The committee plans on meeting each quarter with a different department to go over in detail what projects they are prioritizing and, and try to work out some, uh, just dive a little deeper in what's going on in each department. Um, once we have a good handle on how short we really are, it's our plan to try to launch initiatives to finding new sources of revenue this coming year. And with that said, I, I want to make a motion to pass the budget as amended. Thank uh, you. I would second that uh, motion and also like to make just a brief comment to uh, follow up on Commissioner Holder's comments, uh, which were very well stated. As a member of the Finance Committee, uh, I witnessed the work that Amanda and Lindsay and the department heads uh, and director uh, put into the process. And on behalf of the Commission, we really would like to thank you and appreciate uh, your good work. 
we really don't have, I mean, we're not immune to inflation that's going on that's very real. And we don't have a spending problem uh, in the department. We have a revenue problem in the department. We've been capped for the better part of 20 years on, uh, in excess of 20 years, on our ability to generate additional revenue. Uh, and if you can imagine uh, what expenses have done over that same 20-year uh, period of time with inflation, and uh, how much less the same dollars will uh, fund each year. So uh, I would like to reiterate that the Commission is very, very focused on helping find ways to move initiatives forward to increase revenue. It's, uh, it's, been, a, it's been a priority of the departments for some time, uh, but for uh, reasons that are no fault of our own uh, uh, and no fault of our staff, we've not been able to, to move that ball forward. And so we're gonna have to start looking at other creative ways and other initiatives, and we're very committed to doing so. So just wanna thank you for your, your efforts. Yes. And your patience while we work on that. And thank you, Commissioners Holder and Dillingham. Those were great comments. And <coughs> All right, we're now at item 13, and I, <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, a motion I, I thought we did that, I'm sorry. Mr. Mabry? Aye. Mr. Deal? Aye. Mr. Barwick? Aye. Mr. Holder? Aye. Mr. Dillingham? Aye. Mr. Kane? Aye. Mr. Gaddis? Aye. Thank you. All right. When we are on item 13. Um, so item 13 is just pulling out separate um, for your consideration the 1% cost of living adjustment for retirees in accordance with the retirement plan. That would be for 1% and effective January 1, 2024, funded 500,000 in this fiscal year and 500,000 in next fiscal year. I'd move for approval. Second. And I'd also like to make a comment on that if I might. Uh, mm -hmm. Just with regards to 1% might seem laughable uh, to some. And it's not, uh, it's not intended to be reflective of worth or with regards to what true cost of living uh, adjustments are, are necessary. It's just we wanted to do something. We can't afford to do much. Uh, this is a million dollar expenditure over two different budget years as it is. We recognize it's not enough, but um, it's what we feel like we can do at this time. Thank you. I have a question. Did the uh, committee look at other ways of uh, helping out the retirees? In other words, I think there's a, is there a $200 a month stipend that goes to insurance? How, mu how much does the department put in for insurance, for health insurance for retirees? Let me pull it up real quick because I do have that. I mean, if we're looking at ways to help uh, the retirees, but understanding our budget constraints. I mean, maybe that's something to look at. Because that, that's something you can look at that that's, that's real money. Uh, yeah, and the commission did increase that. Not too long ago. Not too yeah, long ago, right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, by quite a bit, too. I think it was like $100 or something. I think something. it was as well. So I would encourage the committee to look at that in the future to see if, see if that might be even better than a COLA. COLA. Bump. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, July 1, 2018, the uh, department contributions for insurance increased to $250 from $150. And Amanda, where do those dollars come from? Our revenue. Yeah, so it still gets to, it's, I mean, it's one hand or the other. It's a great point, and we've got to look at it holistically, but it's still dollars on a limited cap of dollars we have available. Those aren't dollars that would be available from outside our normal revenues uh, to fund that, unfortunately. All right. Yes, we need, uh, do we need to do that on the floor? Yeah. Commissioner we'll Mabry? Aye. Commissioner Beal? Aye. Commissioner Barwick? Aye. Commissioner Holder? Aye. Commissioner Dillingham? Aye. Commissioner Kane? Aye. Commissioner Gaddis? Aye. Thank you, Amanda. All right, uh, we have Bill Dinkins again for item 14. Thank you, Chairwoman Gaddis. Uh, good morning, or good mid-morning, I guess, commissioners. 
Uh, as we normally do this time of year, a couple of resolutions for y'all to consider. But I would like to point out that uh, Commissioner Barwick, in the interest of more information, I asked staff, if you'll notice the agenda item has updates in front of it for both of these. And the purpose of that is I agree we need to do a better job providing information about our programs, what's going on, and uh, some of the results. So Paxton, if you want to come up, you're, you're first up with the migratory birds. You know, Paxton, uh, if y'all remember, I think it was November of last year, came to us, came to you and presented a, a donation. And that was his one month on the job as a, as a migratory bird biologist. So he's, uh, he's been in that role since November of last year, and he's going to give us an update on the process. And, procedure and some of the considerations uh, that went into the resolution as, as well as an update. So, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, just going to kind of go through and talk about how we select season for migratory birds. Uh, this year it's not going to be anything new or different. Uh, Central Flyway is operating in a liberal package still for waterfowl. Uh, that's determined by the DARP adaptive harvest management model that we, uh, we kind of hash out in the Central Flyway Technical Committees. Uh, and then that we forward recommendations up to the Central Flyway Council, which uh, my supervisor Jerry sits on. Uh, and the main metrics for the adaptive harvest management model is the breeding population of birds uh, and their habitat in the prairie pothole region. And so the, they take those and then they will basically, the, the Fish and Wildlife Service will allow us a liberal, a moderate, conservative, or a closed season packages. Uh, and so we're well within the liberal package still this year. And then with another uh, wet season in the prairie pothole region, it, it's looking good to have a couple more liberal seasons uh, in the future. Uh, and then, yeah, we're moving to the adaptive harvest management model for morning doves as well. <coughs> and then the only real change is the dove falconry season will be a little bit different than last year because they had adjusted it to facilitate the National Falconers Association uh, meeting that they had here in Oklahoma. Uh, that's all for me. Are there any questions? <coughs> Thank you, Paxton. Appreciate your good work. Yes. Thank you so much. I might just recommend a minor amendment to this um, resolution and the therefore be it resolved clause towards the order at uh, the bottom that we just strike and ordered right here. Oh, okay. Yeah, in that regard, J.D., you and I discussed uh, that necessary. perhaps we should use the word authorized because that's kind of a term that's used in the Constitution, authorized and approved. Whichever, in fact, it'd be probably more proper for a commissioner to offer the amendment if you want to so offer yeah, that. Yeah, con considering the, the, the things that are going on right now, <laughs> uh, I think everybody had an email on that. Uh, we just changed that language to now, therefore, be it resolved, authorized, and approved pursuant to. So that would be the only change. And from now on, I think that's how we're going to uh, draft our resolution. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. It'll say, therefore, be it resolved, authorized, and approved. Yep. Okay. Okay. And move for approval. Second. Any other discussion or questions? Second. Second. Roll call. Commissioner Mabry. Aye. Commissioner Beal. Aye. Commissioner Barwick. Aye. Commissioner Holder. Aye. Commissioner Dillingham. Aye. Commissioner Kane. Aye. Commissioner Gaddis. Aye. Thank you again. All right, thanks, Paxton. Um, the next item is our antlerless resolution, and Dallas Barber is going to come up and present that. You know, Dallas has been in this big game biologist position for roughly almost six years. Um, done an outstanding job. You know, like I said, there's and Dal, I'm not going to steal his thunder, but he's got some really exciting news to tell you about this past season. He's got some numbers, and uh, Dal, so I'll just turn it over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for uh, giving me some time to come talk to you guys a little bit about our, uh, our deer season from last year. Um, 
before you have a resolution for all of our antlerless season dates, just to nip it to the bud, nothing's really changing there. Um, things are going pretty well for us in regards to, to antlerless harvest based on percentage, deer populations, hunter uh, participation and harvest rates are, are, are going quite well. Um, total harvest from that 2022-23 season uh, is going to be a record harvest for us again this year. Uh, a little north of 131,000 deer harvested last year across the state. Um, that's going to break that record that we made in 2020 of 121,000 deer harvested. So. We were claiming, you know, COVID really bumped up hunter numbers and we'll probably never see harvest numbers like this again. Um, here we are harvesting more deer than, than we've ever harvested before. Um, the one really important metric from that harvest total is that 45% of that was made up of antlerless deer. So we have asked our hunters to carry a torch and they have lit a bonfire for us. Um, that's right where we want to stay in that 40 to 45% range. So they're getting uh, not necessarily ahead of themselves, but definitely doing good for our deer herds across the state, something that we will definitely be uh, looking at on a statewide basis as far as antlerless harvest goes. A um, couple more records, archery harvest record, uh, 40,000 deer, just a hair north of 40,000 deer with archery tackle, uh, 80,000 deer harvested with a gun this year, just again, just a hair north of that. Uh, that's going to be a record. We set that in 2020. Um, archery records have been set every year since 2018. So that's just a, a method that continues to, to grow and grow and grow in our state. Um, youth deer gun, a uh, little over 4,000 deer harvested during that three-day season. Um, a a kind of cool factor there is that's 50-50 when it comes to antlerless and antler deer. So a lot of people like to say that kids are out there whacking all these bucks early before anybody else gets a chance. The data is showing that it's really about 50-50 as far as antler and antlerless. Um, a change we did make last year, if you guys remember, we opened up zone 10 to antlerless harvest. Uh, for that holiday antlerless gun season. Um, a great success there. We set a harvest record for our holiday antlerless gun season. Uh, 7,700 deer harvested during that season uh, with about 1,300 of those coming from zone 10, which we opened up. So the people were uh, asking for that and uh, you guys were gracious enough to grant them that season and they, uh, they showed out and showed up harvesting quite a few deer in zone 10. But uh, that's really all I have for you guys. If you guys have any questions, feel free and uh, I appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Dallas. Any questions or discussion? Um, I make a motion to approve with the amendment uh, that we discussed on the last resolution to add the words uh, authorized and approved. Take out the word ordered. I know she went on this one. But. Yeah, we got it fixed over the Okay. Uh, so that's my motion. All right. A second. Any further discussion? I will do roll call. Commissioner Mabry? Aye. Commissioner Deal? Aye. Commissioner Barlow? Aye. Commissioner Holder? Aye. Commissioner Dillingham? Aye. Commissioner Kane? Aye. Commissioner Gaddis? Aye. Thank you very much. Thank Alan. you, guys. <laughs> All right, um, I suggest that uh, maybe we'll take a five-minute break, and, uh, but do we have a the motion, motion on the next item? I think. Um, yeah. 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 Okay. Second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Mabry. Aye. Commissioner Deal. Aye. Commissioner Garwick. Aye. Commissioner Holder. Aye. Commissioner Aye. Aye. Commissioner Kane. Aye. Commissioner Gavin. Aye. Thank you. Hey, Jerry, could you come up here? And then if I'm going to use something that I actually have to rig, it's going to be weightless and weedless on a three-aught, four-aught, or five-aught hook that looks just like this. I like owner hooks. They're a thick wire. They really sharp point, but Jamagatsu, Eagle. Well, hello and welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. I'm Todd Craighead. For several decades, the Wildlife Department has hosted fishing clinics all across the state. But as our world has changed around us, we in turn have had to learn to adapt and grow in response. So a new era of additional fishing clinics are now offered virtually. They're still conducted live by our fishing coordinator, but we're able now to reach a whole new audience. These Ask an Angler virtual fishing courses are not intended to replace the traditional in-person clinics like at a city park pond, but it offers us an opportunity to go more in depth with certain subjects. So if you're wanting to get, say, into the weeds, 
around things like pre-spawn bass tips or maybe winter pond fishing techniques or crappie fishing tips. These virtual classes are perfect. You can either watch them live or find them on our Outdoor Oklahoma YouTube channel. A wildlife department that adapts its ways of communication to help make you the most educated and effective sportsman you can be. Just another reason to love Oklahoma and the adventures that await you. Well, it's been a while since our last catfishing episode, and I know there's a lot of you out there who really enjoy bank fishing for catfish just as much as I do, so we're gonna give it another try today. In our first episode, we focused on points that jut out into lakes. That's one of my favorite spots to fish, especially if there's been a, a headwind or a, a flanking headwind blowing into that point, sometimes very productive for catfish and lakes. The next episode, we just fished an old mud flat. Many of our lakes here in Oklahoma have, especially on the upper end of the lakes, mud flats with basically no topography, no structure to speak of, no variation in depth, all the things you normally look for in a good catfishing spot. But those mud flats get really, really productive, especially in the springtime, particularly when the shad start spawning and you can really fill up a stringer sometimes. But we're gonna switch gears today a little bit and employ one of my favorite tactics for bank fishing for catfish, and that's fishing in running water after a flooding rain, which is what we've had here in the Texoma region. We've had an exceptionally dry spring. Today's the last day of April, but a couple of days ago, we finally got that big rain, over four inches in most of the basin of Texoma. And as you can see behind me here, the water's running. There's many creeks that run into Texoma. This is one in particular that's just starting to widen out into the lake, which is a place I really like to target when it's running. Still a lot of foam and debris coming down, there's a lot of rough fish in here, carp, buffalo, gar, drum. Hopefully we can wade through them and, and catch a couple of catfish because catfish love to nose up into fresh, muddy water. Now that's probably an oxymoron, but you know what I mean. When the flooding water comes down these creeks, it brings all types of nutrients and bait, all types of dead material washing down, and they basically go on a feeding frenzy. And hopefully we'll have some up in here looking to eat today. Now what I'm gonna use today and these are basically six foot Walmart specials. And I have old Ambassador 5000s on each of them. I bought them used off of eBay. And anyone in the know on catfishing reels knows that an old Ambassador 5000, especially the old Swedish models, are fantastic. One, maybe one of the best, if not the best overall catfishing reel. If you take even decent care of them, they can last you years and perhaps even decades. I've got them spooled up with Berkley Trilene Big Game 30 pound test line, so we can hold anything if we happen to get a hold of a big one today. And basically, my setup is, is real simple, same as always. I got a four ounce bank sinker on the bottom. Up above that, about a foot and a half. I'll tie a, a leader into my line, probably 10 inches, and then have a Eagle Claw wide bend laser sharp number four hook on that. I also always bring my favorite rod with me. It'll hopefully see some action at some point today. It's just a, a real limber, medium action, again, Walmart six foot rod that I've got an old Shimano Calcutta with 20 pound Berkeley big game line on because, you know, I get a fish on that and it kind of harkens back to the cane pole days with all of the, the flexibility. So I always enjoy catching fish on that as well. Bait for today, now in running water, Almost any bait will work because they're out here looking for anything they can get a hold of to eat. Worms, crawdads, cut perch, chicken liver, shad, you name it. But my go-to bait is always fresh shad. And I was fortunate enough to catch some big gizzard shads a few days ago in my cast net. Now I'll mention something about shad too. The little shad don't last very long, a day or two, and they start getting soft and they won't stay on your hook very well. But I want you to know those big gizzard shad, if you'll take care of them, keep them relatively dry and packed in ice, they're good to go for a week and even more. 
In fact, these shad I have today, I've got cut up into chunks, but they're five days old, so we'll see how they work out. I also have some earthworms. Of course, that's a fantastic bait in running water. The earthworms I have, I actually grow myself. I had an old boy that was throwing away a chest-type freezer. It was inoperable, and so he gave it to me for free. I bought a 50-pound bag of what's called Spangled Peat Moss from Walmart. I saturated that peat moss, set it in the bottom of that chest freezer, probably about a foot deep, put my earthworms in there. They're called Georgia Browns. They're not as long as a night crawler, but they're real fishy worms. They'll definitely catch catfish if there's any around. And I feed them about once a week with chicken crumbles. It's basically chicken feet. You can get a 50 pound bag at a feed store for seven, eight dollars. And if you think about it, you can hardly buy two containers of night crawlers at the bait shop for, for that much money. So it's pretty economical. And I keep that chest freezer on the north side of my shop building so it doesn't get that direct hot sunlight during the summer. And they, they'll keep all year round and they'll reproduce in there. So you'll always have bait available when it's time to go fishing. And lastly, I've got some grub worms. Just white grubs, beetle grubs. I don't use them very often because I don't find them, quite frankly, very often. But funny story, a couple of days ago, we was having one of those big deluges of rain. And I looked outside, I have a dog, it's a shepherd mix named Shep, real original I know, but he was a rescue dog. And I saw him eating stuff off of the ground, running here and there. I didn't have any idea what he was doing. So I went out there to take a look and those grub worms were coming up out of that wet ground to get out of the, the water. And he was picking them off one by one and swallowing them down kind of like a great blue heron swallowing a perch or something. I didn't know dogs would eat grub worms, but this one will. Maybe he's watched too many episodes of Naked and Afraid, I'm not sure, but I was able to get ahead of him and get me about a dozen, so we'll put grub worm on one of these poles and see if it'll produce. Grub worm was always one of my dad's favorite fishing baits, and my dad and I, this time of year in April, would always take a week, I would take off work. We would fish all week, every day, bank fishing for catfish. We did that for decades. And he passed away uh, last day of November in 2020, died of COVID-19 actually. And so I'm going to dedicate this day to him because I know he would love to be here today. Now he lived a, a, a long life. He was just two weeks shy of 95 years old, healthy the whole time, uh, World War II, Battle of the Bulge Vet. So he had a full life and he's gone on to his reward. So that's a good thing. But uh, we'll dedicate this day to him. But enough talking, we're gonna get these baited out and tossed in and see if we can get a rod to bend. We'll, uh, we'll put a piece of cut shad on this first one here. And I've cut these shad up. They come off of a, a big shad. I just fillet them off of the shad and then cut them into, oh, probably two inch strips that are probably a half inch wide. Now the thing to remember is you want to have plenty of your hook exposed after you put this chunk of shad on there. So just come down probably an eighth to a quarter of an inch below the top of the cut bait, bring it through, make sure any scales that were on the barb or the tip of the hook are removed so you have that sharp hook and your barb available. And that's a good thing about these wide bend hooks. You have plenty of, of hook remaining because that's a big bait and you don't want to get the bait over the point of your hook or you'll lose the hook set every time. Put that one right out by that floating debris out there. That's always a little bit of structure. Even in running water, I like to target it. We're gonna put a grub worm on this hook. It's one of those big white grubs I was talking to you about earlier. Now, one thing I will do with these, they've got a natural bend in them. And if you bring the hook through that natural bend, sometimes that worm will be in the way of your point. So what I'll do is come behind the head there, the opposite direction of the bend cast that out and see if something's interested in a grub today.
put some earthworms on this one. These are those little Georgia brown worms that I was telling you about earlier. They're not big, but they're active. And I don't think there's any proper way to hook worms on. I know, have a way I do it. I like to leave as much of the worm wiggling off of the hook as possible. So I'll basically grab about, I'll come down from one end of the worm, just a few millimeters, bring the point of the hook through, oh, maybe a quarter inch, bring it back out, fold the worm over, do that again, and then come back out of the worm before I reach his other tip. So you have all of those worm tips floundering around out in the water. I think that's a good thing. I like a full hook of worms as long as I've got plenty of the end of the hook exposed, the tip of the hook. That'll do it. I saw those earthworm. First fish of the day. She's coming to her milk. Nice one. That's what it's all about. Fish on on the little pole. That one hit a piece of that shad. We got here another blue cat. Now that's the kind of action we like to see right there. He's talking to us. He's loquacious. As Carl from Sling Blade might say, I like the way you talk. Mm. Anyway, this is a blue cat. Of course, they're generally lighter than color in color than a channel cat, but the uh, Best way to identify them, because sometimes in certain water turbidities, they look kind of similar, especially a, a bull-headed channel cat can resemble a, a blue cat out of clearer water. On the anal fin here, a blue cat is blunt, straight across, B and B. A channel cat is curved, C and C. That's how I always remember them. But yeah, that's a, that's a pretty Lake Texoma blue cat right there. Really good eating size. I figure that fish will weigh four pounds maybe. That one's going to weigh about seven and a half pounds. He's fat, meaty, makes some fine fillets. Well, right on time, there's a little channel cat. We can take a look at it and the difference between it and a blue cat. Oh, he's talking to two. Now these channel cat are usually golden colored, of course, and a lot of times we'll have some spots or speckles on them. But again, that anal fin down at the bottom, you'll see that it's got a curve to it. Unlike a, a blue cat, that'll be blunt straight across. So channel curve, blue cat blunt. And normally you can tell just at a glance by their color and so forth, but occasionally they look fairly similar and that's the, the best way to scientifically tell the difference. But we'll let him grow a little bit. Hello. Yeah. Tell you what, I take those all day long, twice on Sunday. Really nice eating size channel cat. Doesn't have to be worms. I think I'm gonna string him up. I don't know what the bite force is on these channel cat, but it's up there. Well, we've already got enough for supper. It's just bonus from here on out. 
There we go. Yeah, we'll uh, weigh that one up. That's just a, a fantastic blue cat. I love fishing this running water. Yeah, he's gonna clear 12. It's always from the tip of the snout to the end of one of the forks in the tail. 30 and one quarter, so we've got our 30 inch fish for the day. 12, and 12, 12 and a half pounds, that's what it's all about. We'll dedicate that one to my dad, Marvin Banner right there. He would, he'd have a smile a mile long to catch fish like that. I enjoy all types of fishing, I really do. Anything that's biting, I like to be there attempting to catch it, but there is something special about catfishing to me. You know, when you can set your poles out on a beautiful day like today, sit back and relax and, you know, watch you getting a bite right now and let the fish come to you. I like that more passive type of fishing. It's, to me, it's more relaxing and I think that's why I give it the edge over other types of, of fishing from the bank. Kind of tricky. Well, this water's clear. Sure is. Ah, uh, that's probably good. Take these life jackets off. Yeah, I figured we'd come over here and try to catch a few small fish, hopefully a big one. What depth of water are we gonna fish? Uh, we're gonna fish probably area from five to 12 feet of water. Yeah. What makes this so good down here? Well, I, I liked on this Carolina rig over this high driller. Seems to be a pretty good area. Are you throwing a ringworm? Throwing a Jane LaRue ringworm, yeah. Plum color. I'm gonna fish this power lizard. Yeah. So hopefully we'll catch some fish. Okay. He don't look 14. Nah, I don't think he'll make it. It is a start though. He's out there in that channel, wasn't he? Yeah, just right off. When did you catch that fish? Last year, that big fish. Caught the uh, 14 pound, 10 ounce state record fish March the 25th last year. Do you have that date like engraved? Yeah. Yeah. I don't blame you. Yeah. It's Something may stick with me for a long time, I think. But you pretty much have come up here just looking for for more or larger fish and you don't fish much else, do you? I've pretty much during spawn season that uh, it's the only lake you'll find me on. And normally I'm fishing for big fish. You think there's another one in here bigger? I I feel like there probably is. Since then, I've caught a few big fish, but nothing really close to 14 pounds. You find 
that you fish differently, just looking for big fish or use different baits or something like that? More so well, than you, you would if you're just you, out. You pay more attention to, to your line and your knots that you tie and really look for bad spots and things like that more than I really used to. Knowing that there is a possibility of catching a fish that big. There he is. It may lift that fish. Nah. Right. I think the, I think mine's a little bigger than yours. Yeah, I believe he was. I tell you what, he ate that lizard. Yeah, they're hitting it right on the fall there. Is he bigger? Fish might be a little bit bigger than the last one, but no, not a whole lot. Was better. He ate that thing on the first cast. Get back on our trolling motor here. Yeah, he's all right. A little better fish. Swimming down. There's a bunch of fish on that point. Wind and hydrilla. <laughs> we may have to just call it a day. Go in, eat lunch or something, come back out later. All right. We've uh, had a pretty good day of, or a pretty good morning of fishing, should yeah. I say, anyway. Nothing big, but hey, at least they were biting. All right. So we say we'll go eat some dinner. Okay. Let's go. Well, we hope today's stories remind you that Oklahoma is such a perfect state to explore. So however you choose to enjoy our state's incredible natural world, remember that your adventure starts with Outdoor Oklahoma. Outdoor Oklahoma is produced by the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation and is proud to serve and be funded entirely by sportsmen and women and outdoor enthusiasts who love and appreciate all things wild in the great state of Oklahoma.
And then if I'm going to use something that I actually have to rig, it's going to be weightless and weedless on a three aught, four aught, or five aught hook that looks just like this. I like owner hooks. They're a thick wire. They really sharp point, but Jamagatsu, Eagle. Well, hello and welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. I'm Todd Craighead. For several decades, the wildlife department has hosted fishing clinics all across the state. But as our world has changed around us, we in turn have had to learn to adapt and grow in response. So a new era of additional fishing clinics are now offered virtually. They're still conducted live by our fishing coordinator, but we're able now to reach a whole new audience. These Ask an Angler virtual fishing courses are not intended to replace the traditional in-person clinics like at a city park pond, but it offers us an opportunity to go more in depth with certain subjects. So if you're wanting to get, say, into the weeds, well, things like pre-spawn bass tips, or maybe winter pond fishing techniques, or crappie fishing tips. These virtual classes are perfect. You can either watch them live or find them on our Outdoor Oklahoma YouTube channel. A wildlife department that adapts its ways of communication to help make you the most educated and effective sportsman you can be. Just another reason to love Oklahoma and the adventures that await you. Well, it's been a while since our last catfishing episode, and I know there's a lot of you out there who really enjoy bank fishing for catfish just as much as I do, so we're gonna give it another try today. In our first episode, we focused on points that jut out into lakes. That's one of my favorite spots to fish, especially if there's been a, a headwind or a, a flanking headwind blowing into that point, sometimes very productive for catfish and lakes. The next episode, we just fished an old mud flat. Many of our lakes here in Oklahoma have, especially on the upper end of the lakes, mud flats with basically no topography, no structure to speak of, no variation in depth, all the things you normally look for in a good catfishing spot. But those mud flats get really, really productive, especially in the springtime, particularly when the shad start spawning and you can really fill up a stringer sometimes. But we're gonna switch gears today a little bit and employ one of my favorite tactics for bank fishing for catfish, and that's fishing in running water after a flooding rain, which is what we've had here in the Texoma region. We've had a exceptionally dry spring. Today's the last day of April, but a couple of days ago, we finally got that big rain, over four inches in most of the basin of Texoma. And as you can see behind me here, the water's running. There's many creeks that run into Texoma. This is one in particular that's just starting to widen out into the lake, which is a place I really like to target when it's running. Still a lot of foam and debris coming down, there's a lot of rough fish in here, carp, buffalo, gar, drum. Hopefully we can wade through them and, and catch a couple of catfish because catfish love to nose up into fresh, muddy water. Now that's probably an oxymoron, but you know what I mean. When the flooding water comes down these creeks, it brings all types of nutrients and bait, all types of dead material washing down, and they basically go on a feeding frenzy. And hopefully we'll have some up in here looking to eat today. Now what I'm gonna use today and these are basically six foot Walmart specials. And I have old Ambassador 5000s on each of them. I bought them used off of eBay. And anyone in the know on catfishing reels knows that an old Ambassador 5000, especially the old Swedish models, are fantastic. One, maybe one of the best, if not the best overall catfishing reel. If you take even decent care of them, they can last you years and perhaps even decades. I've got them spooled up with Berkley Trilene Big Game 30 pound test line, so we can hold anything if we happen to get a hold of a big one today. And basically, my setup is, is real simple, same as always. I got a four ounce bank sinker on the bottom. Up above that, about a foot and a half, I'll tie a, a leader into my line, probably 10 inches, and then have a Eagle Claw wide bend laser sharp number four hook on that. I also always bring my favorite rod with me. It'll hopefully see some action at some point today. It's just a, 
a real limber medium action, again, Walmart six foot rod that I've got an old Shimano Calcutta with 20 pound Berkeley big game line on because, you know, I get a fish on that and it kind of harkens back to the cane pole days with all of the, the flexibility. So I always enjoy catching fish on that as well. Bait for today. Now in running water, almost any bait will work because they're out here looking for anything they can get a hold of to eat. Worms, crawdads, cut perch, chicken liver, shad, you name it. But my go-to bait is always fresh shad. And I was fortunate enough to catch some big gizzard shads a few days ago in my cast net. Now I'll mention something about shad too. The little shad don't last very long, a day or two, and they start getting soft and they won't stay on your hook very well. But I want you to know those big gizzard shad, if you'll take care of them, keep them relatively dry and packed in ice, they're good to go for a week and even more. In fact, the shad I have today, I've got cut up into chunks, but they're five days old. So we'll see how they work out. I also have some earthworms. Of course, that's a fantastic bait in running water. The earthworms I have, I actually grow myself. I had a old boy that was throwing away a chest type freezer. It was inoperable. And so he gave it to me for free. I bought a 50 pound bag of what's called Spangled Peat Moss from Walmart. I saturated that peat moss set it in the bottom of that chest freezer, probably about a foot deep, put my earthworms in there. They're called Georgia Browns. They're not as long as a night crawler, but they're real fishy worms. They'll definitely catch catfish if there's any around. And I feed them about once a week with chicken crumbles. It's basically chicken feet. You can get a 50 pound bag at a feed store for seven, eight dollars. And if you think about it, you can hardly buy two containers of night crawlers at the bait shop for, for that much money. So it's pretty economical. And I keep that chest freezer on the north side of my shop building so it doesn't get that direct hot sunlight during the summer. And they, they'll keep all year round and they'll reproduce in there. So you'll always have bait available when it's time to go fishing. And lastly, I've got some grub worms. Just white grubs, beetle grubs. I don't use them very often because I don't find them quite frankly very often. But funny story, a couple of days ago, we was having one of those big deluges of rain. And I looked outside, I have a dog, it's a shepherd mix named Shep, real original I know, but he was a rescue dog. And I saw him eating stuff off of the ground, running here and there. I didn't have any idea what he was doing. So I went out there to take a look and those grub worms were coming up out of that wet ground to get out of the, the water. And he was picking them off one by one and swallowing them down kind of like a great blue heron swallowing a perch or something. I didn't know dogs would eat grub worms, but this one will. Maybe he's watched too many episodes of Naked and Afraid, I'm not sure, but I was able to get ahead of him and get me about a dozen. So we'll put grub worm on one of these poles and see if it'll produce. Grub worm was always one of my dad's favorite fishing baits. And my dad and I, this time of year in April, would always take a week, I would take off work. We would fish all week, every day, bank fishing for catfish. We did that for decades and he passed away uh, last day of November in 2020 died of COVID-19 actually and so I'm gonna dedicate this day to him because I know he would love to be here today now he lived a, a, a long life he was just two weeks shy of 95 years old healthy the whole time uh, World War II Battle of the Bulge Vet so he had a full life and he's gone on to his reward so that's a good thing but uh, we'll dedicate this day to him but enough talking, we're gonna get these baited out and tossed in and see if we can get a rod to bend. We'll, uh, we'll put a piece of cut shad on this first one here. And I've cut these shad up. They come off of a, a big shad. I just fillet them off of the shad and then cut them into, oh, probably two inch strips that are probably a half inch wide. Now, the thing to remember is you want to have plenty of your hook exposed after you put this chunk of shad on there. So just come down probably an eighth to a quarter of an inch below the top of the cut bait. Bring it through. Make sure any scales that were on the barb or the tip of the hook are removed. So you have that sharp hook and your barb available. And that's the good thing about these wide bend hooks. You have plenty of, of hook remaining because that's a big bait and you don't want to get the bait over the point of your hook or you'll lose the hook set every time. Do we have a motion? Uh, I'd like to go back and open second. Second. Roll call, please. 
Commissioner Mabry, Aye. Commissioner Deal, Aye. Commissioner Barwick, Aye. Commissioner Holver, Aye. Commissioner Dillingham, Aye. Commissioner Kane, Aye. Commissioner Gaddis. Aye. <coughs> Thank you. All right, item 16. I'll probably have a motion. I'm going to make a motion to give the director authority to settle the uh, litigation matter that was discussed and the parameters that we're discussing. Second. Any further discussion or question? Okay. Roll call, please. Commissioner Mabry. Aye. Commissioner Steele. Aye. Commissioner Aye. Warwick. Aye. Commissioner Holder. Aye. Commissioner Dillingham. Aye. Commissioner Kane. Aye. Commissioner Gaddis. Aye. Thank you. All right. Uh, Commissioner Barwick, item 17. It's finally uh, an item that's not controversial. <laughs> um, I'm pleased to announce that the officers of Wild Oklahoma Wildlife Conservation Foundation for fiscal year 2024 are Reagan Siegfried, President, and House Vice President Richard Hatcher, Secretary Treasurer. As required by the bylaws of the Foundation, the Commission must vote on and approve the slate of director candidates selected by the Foundation's Board of Directors, which we did it. Third, the fleet of candidates for approval, which really are reappointments because they're existing directors right now, are Will Reagan, myself, Ethan House, uh, House, and Tess Monty. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with those candidates, and uh, therefore I make a motion to approve those four candidates to serve as directors of the Foundation Board. All right. Any questions? I'll second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Mabry. Aye. Commissioner Deal. Aye. Commissioner Barwick. Aye. Commissioner Holder. Aye. Commissioner Dillingham. Aye. Commissioner Kane. Aye. Commissioner Gaddis. Aye. I also encourage all commissioners to make uh, annual donations to the foundation because if you all aren't supportive of it, it's kind of hard to go to the outside public and gain yeah. garner support. So I do good. appreciate that the uh, donations that have been made, but you know, we really appreciate that. Very good. Thank you, Jim. All right. Uh, in the absence of Commissioner Zelps, who is uh, chairman of the nominating committee, item 18 will be tabled until our next meeting. Um, and number 19, new business, anything that uh, was not known about or foreseen 24 hours prior to the meeting? Uh, I think not. <laughs> okay. uh, and a reminder, a July 3rd meeting has been canceled. Um, and with that, we will see you in August. Thank you. <laughs>